Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we really appreciated that winter cold day. Most of you made it to our library. My name is Rigafi Devoke. I am teaching staff member here at Cody, and I teach conflict transformation and peace building at Cody Institute. Before we begin, I would like to invite Sydney. Sydney is our intern working with me on different uh, initiatives, and she will do the land acknowledgement. Cindy. Thank you, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wolastiquic people first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of land and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolastiquic title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. With that being said, we are here today to talk about peace building. As educators, students, community members, and lifelong learners, it is important to not neglect the parts of our history that still impact us all today. The past is still with us and the consequences and violence of colonization are still manifested today in many Indigenous communities, both locally and across the world. We are here today to talk about peace, which pertains not only to the absence of violence, but also includes fostering an environment that encourages economic justice, racial equity, religious and political freedom and autonomy over factors that allow each of us internal and external harmony. So I challenge us to go beyond simply acknowledging that we are still in fact in the ancestral unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people and ask ourselves what we can all do with the privilege we have to make measurable changes in the way we proceed after today. Whether it be improving awareness of our personal biases, making a conscious effort to better understand the culture and views that existed here before us, or educating ourselves on the history of violence and oppression to better be equipped to stand for a future of peace. Thank you, thank you. Um, the next uh, on the agenda is uh, for me to invite Eileen the executive director of Cordia Institute to say a few things about our gathering today. Thank you so much, Degafi, and welcome everybody. It's such a nice turnout in the Marine Michael Library today. And I'm so grateful that all of you have been able to come um, and spend some time with us on a cold and nice and sunny, but cold uh, January afternoon. And I can't think of a nicer way to come together than to celebrate and have a discussion with Sister Joanne and Darlene about the long, her story of the Sisters of St. Martha <laughs> um, and just how much um, it has been integral to the work that we have all been part of. I think many of you in this room will have your own stories to share and to tell about the Sisters of St. Martha and their importance in this community. Um, but let me share with you just a couple things and you know I'm a I'm a relative relative newcomer I've only been here for 10 years <laughs> um but the history of the sisters goes back so far back to you know 1900 when it, uh, the congregation was first established here at, at St. FX and actually this was the mother house mm -hmm. of the sisters of St. Martha and you know obviously it's a it's a beautifully renovated building now but I often think about their presence here and the room down at the end of the hall that if you go down there, you would see that that was um, the chapel uh, area for the sisters. Um, and, and so right in this very building is such a rich history um, and the stories in the walls. I mean, if the walls could talk, I'm sure there would be some really interesting, interesting things said, but founded in 1900, really with that active service orientation that that we've come to admire um, and that's never left the Sisters of St. Martha. Um, when Reverend Dr. Moses Cody came to Anaganish, he was so impressed by the sisters and about what they stood for. I mean, actually um, he really helped to advocate for their, their independence from the university <clears throat> and, um, and was a big admirer, but also could see obviously the value of their service. And, and I know there's a there's an off quote, uh, often quoted line where he says that if you just had 50 Marthas to work with, he could change the whole world. <laughs> if I were to meet him now, I would probably want to be a bit, um, 
you know, a devil's advocate and say, well, actually, it's them changing the world. You're just coming along for the ride. <laughs> and I think that really also um, is something to say in terms of the understated presence of the sisters. Um, but at the same time, um, really um, moving us into new ground, new territory um, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see from um, from religious sisters. They were they were um, way ahead of their time in many ways, and that was um, demonstrated over and over again. In fact, many of the act acts of the Sisters of St. Martha were really what led to the Antigonish movement, the backbone of the activities of the Antigonish movement, for which Father Moses Cody and Father Jimmy Tompkins are, are often celebrated, really couldn't have happened without that active engagement of the sisters. And so for me, that, that history, that, that piece is so important. And it then became um, an element, you know, the sisters became an integral part of the extension department, um, Sister Irene Doyle, Sister Martin Marie Michael, probably many others down the road that I'm not that I'm not remembering were actively uh, engaged in the extension extension department. They were actively engaged in the adult education department of our university. Um, and over time, they also did field work that probably would have been um, and it still stands the test of time. Now it was again ahead of their time where you were working with rural women is the congregation in ways that many of us um, continue to aspire to do um, through our work. Um, of course, Marie, uh, Sister Mary Michael, Marie Michael is well known for her time in the extension department, but then she retrained to be a librarian and was an amazing part of Cody International in that role. And um, of course, now um, given that, given her, um, that legacy that she left on so many international students, as well as students here on campus at the time, we've actually named this library after her. And I think that's an important reminder, again, of the connection point. And, you know, I could go on and on, um, but, you know, there's more recent history has included Sister Joanne as part of the Cody International Institute staff mm -hmm. and so many other connection points for which we remain eternally grateful, mm -hmm. whether it's just supporting me in, a, in an interim capacity when I was interim or even as I've taken on this new role of recognizing things that we need in order to thrive at Cody Institute, now that it's amalgamated between Extension and the Cody International, of providing sage advice, of continued funding support, of just continuing to be, um, you know, everything we would need from what I would call big sisters. Mm. Um, in so many ways, not to mention, of course, coming with their grace, with their prayers, and so on. So I'm so humbled and thankful for everything that the Sisters of St. Martha have done for Cody. I'm really looking forward to that continuation of it, and grateful that today you're going to be here to share some information with us, to share some reflections, particularly around the concept of peace and justice. Um, finally, I'll just make one note, and that is Again, ahead of their time, the, the sisters um, really believe strongly in creating a, a chair in social justice back in, in early 2000. And we've spent the last several years now, um, probably way longer than we wanted to, rethinking that and reimagining what that chair could be. And we're ready to relaunch as a Cody fund for social justice. Darlene is very much part of that work. Um, that again, will continue to ensure that we're benefiting community community members that their knowledge and ways of knowing are brought front and center in all the work that we do. So thank you so much, Dagafi, for letting me say a few words. And thank you, Darlene and jo Sister Joanne for being here, as well as all of you today. And, uh, looking forward to your conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. Um, I have a dual task of making coffee and also facilitating the conversation. So I'll be relinquishing my power and going with the kitchen soon mm -hmm. to make coffee for all of you. Uh, before I do that, though, um, the topic of our conversation today is Sisters of St. Martha, Lifelong Journey of Peace. As we reflect the role and contribution of Sisters of St. Martha here in Aniganish and beyond, we are also mindful of the state of the world today. War, violence, climate emergency, and economic hardships all converging 
wants and they demand our collective action in addressing them. Today, we have two distinguished individuals amongst us. Uh, sorry, I, sh I shouldn't have actually said two distinguished Irish instead of two <laughs> distinguished individuals, O'Leary and O'Regan. The apostrophe uh, matters. That's well. right. And I don't know what's about, what is all about the Irish and social justice. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, there is no short answer when when I ask questions with my Irish friends and family members about social justice, it's always a mini seminar. <laughs> uh, and uh, let me let me let me just say a few introductory or biographical description of who these individuals are. Sister Joanne Regan, born and raised in Toronto. Sister Joanne holds a BA in Christianity and Culture from the University of St. Michael's College. Toronto, and MA in Conflict Studies at St. Paul University, Ottawa. This is where we met. I met uh, Sister Joanne when I was doing my master's. She was also doing her master's at the same school. And an MA in Pastoral Ministry from Boston College. Sister Joanne entered the Sisters of St. Martha in 2001 and made perpetual profession of vows in 2009. She has been involved in various areas of social justice ministry, including peace education at the Cody Institute. Sister Joanne is in her second term on the Martha's leadership team, having been elected general counselor in, 2000, in, in 2014 and again in 2019. The next bio, I'll just read it as you were sent to me. Uh, and there is reason for that. Uh, uh, Darlene O'Leary is the, the coordinator of Martha Justice Ministry with the Sisters of St. Martha and Ganesh. She has a PhD in theology and ethics from St. Paul University in Ottawa. For several years, she was the executive director of Galilee Center in Arnprior, Ontario, where she ran spirituality and social justice programming. She, has, she was also the social economic policy analyst with Citizens for Public Justice in Ottawa, where she worked primarily on poverty eradication in Canada. She currently serves as the Martha's NGO liaison for the Sisters of Charity Foundation, Charity Federation, sorry, UNMGO. And she says she grew up in PEI and lives in Antigonish with her husband, Degafi, and Kat Foster. <laughs> And if you want to know who the guy is, that's me. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm privileged to be in the middle of two, these two great women. Uh, one of them, actually, uh, my, my lifelong partner in, in, in seeking the truth and justice. And as I speak here, and as I listen to Eileen, I was looking up there in the library. It says, truth is non-denominational and at the disposal of all. That's what uh, Reverend Moses Cody said. So we are very excited you two are here. Uh, and as I move into the kitchen and the, the mic is for you and I will be listening from my location over there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. Do you want me to go? Yeah. I... Uh, thank you. It, it's funny. This is like a full circle moment for me in some ways, because I met Darlene, well, actually I met DeGaffey first, met him. We were in the same <laughs> class and he was one of those people. We were both a little bit older than everybody else in the class. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those people when he contributed, I sat up and listened. You know, there's somebody like that mm -hmm. in every class. Now, I remember thinking he could be at Cody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And then I met Darlene in a totally different capacity and thinking, I want her to work for us. <laughs> it was a pipe dream and here she is. So it's a bit of a full circle moment. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I have to confess, it's a bit difficult for me these days in the state of the world to even consider saying that I'm involved in peace education or peace building, because it seems impossible. Mm -hmm. It just seems really difficult. And I feel totally inadequate to have anything to offer to change that. So that's part of, I think, why it's so important to have times like this when we can just talk about what does it mean to be about peace. So I did work here at the Cody 
And it was a bit of a spiritual homecoming for me coming here um, without knowing it because I felt such a deep connection to the work here. Um, I learned a lot about what it, what it meant to be a sister of St. Martha by being at the Cody and working at the Cody and meeting the people that I met, um, meeting family members of Moses Cody. Um, but just that, that whole spiritual underpinning of, of this movement, the Anaganish movement that I had heard so much about. Um, so it did, it did really impact my identity as a Martha. So, um, which for me says that it was of the spirit that I came here. So, and I was also blessed to have a mentor here in Dr. Thomas Mark Touré, Dr. Peace. I learned much from him. Some I can articulate and most I can't. Uh, he really was a gift in my life and I miss him greatly, but I channel him a lot <laughs> and he's with me. He's always with me. And every person that I encountered here, all the staff, everybody, they really impacted me greatly. The participants, everybody. I learned a lot about peace building, even from the, ho the housekeeping staff at the residence and how they were with participants. So there's always something to learn. <clears throat> so I'm going to place all of this in context. So when I sat down to say, what am I going to say about who we are? I thought, I'm not going to go through this linear line of history and the places we've been and the things we've done. It's more about, I want to talk about the, the underpinning, the why we do what we do, what animates us, what gives us that sense of being about peace building um, in our way of life. So what we articulate as our charism or the thing that is the essence is about what we why we do what we do and what finds us gathered together as a community of women in a congregation is our mission. So we're gonna show our mission statement. Mm -hmm. Is yep. it up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. So what we say is that we sisters of St. Martha, inspired by God's graciousness, hear, embrace and respond to the cry for gospel hospitality. This was present to a, it, with us as a group from the beginning, but we would never have articulated it that way, I think. I think we've grown to understand it in a deeper way. Um, but it was the spark of that has always been present with us. So our roots, as you know, are in homemaking, which means making space for life to unfold. There are things that have to be done, but you're also making space for life to unfold and making room for others and tending to the needs of others. So you're paying attention, you're tending to their needs. So the next slide, as Eileen mentioned, um, we were founded to take care of the domestic needs of this school. And our original mother house is really right there. I don't know, this was something, this was classrooms in an infirmary or something, but our original mother house was right there. Um, so it, it's wonderful to walk, like you say, in the, in the in the halls here to just sort of kind of get that spirit of, and in fact, we have stairs from the original staircase when the renovation was happening. So our first sisters were formed actually by the Sisters of Charity in Halifax um, before 1900. And they, they are rooted in the life and the mission of St. Vincent de Paul. And there's a quote from St. Vincent de Paul that I've discovered recently and I find really, it helps me understand our connection to the charities in a deeper way. And it's that, what do we find in God? We see the dignity of persons and the unity of essence. So I think that that for me is a beginning point for us is that it is about seeing the dignity of the person first and foremost. In fact, that's the prime principle of Catholic social teaching. And the prime um, principle or directive or guiding principle, I suppose, of the of the Anaganish movement as well. So those two, th that, that really comes to me about that connection with the charity. So we did bring some of what we learned from them to, to this new congregation. And the next slide. So we were called to be a group by the Bishop of Antigonish, but it was this small group of women who said yes to coming. 
to creating something new, to um, continue um, something. And it actually gifts us, if we let it, the gift of ambiguity, the, the ability to embrace ambiguity. They had no idea what they were saying yes to, except there was a need, they were asked and they said yes. And they felt called, they felt moved to say yes to that. So they, they did, they said yes to the unknown and the not certain and a, and a way forward. It was a way forward. And that collaboration in that, they were a group. So collaboration is a deep root for us. It's a deep touchstone for us as a value. And so we've named it actually as a core value among others. So the next slide. Which slide do you want to do? Oh, wait now, go back. Which one you want? Sorry. I want that one, but I want it to not be, I just wanted, I had it animated. There we go, we're good. <laughs> I mean, it's no big deal. Really. I just actually put the slides up so people aren't looking just at me. <laughs> um, so I, what I want to do is frame the rest of what I'm going to say more around who Martha is and how from my lens as peace educator, where I get that sense of being pe about peace building as a Martha, okay? And how the congregation has responded to that. So St. Martha of Bethany is our patroness, and there are many, many aspects of Martha, but I wanna focus on what I see as Martha is the peacemaker, the peace builder, and a model for peace building actually. And that I see how I see that influence in the congregation. So I'm gonna talk about big feet, thick necks, and a dragon. <laughs> big feet, so the next one should show the feet. There we go. Mm -hmm. Martha's often depicted with big feet. It's a funny thing. I just recently discovered this and it just went, wow, it made a lot of connections for me. So big feet, which for me means she's grounded. She's grounded. She's rooted in what she believes, in her identity, and she's confident, not in an arrogant know-it-all confidence, in a vulnerable confidence. I know who I am. And I'm not a, I'm not I, I'm not going to let that sort of waver. And it's not competitive either. And she's not entrenched. So being rooted and grounded means you're not entrenched, unable to move. It means you're rooted. You're you're grounded. You're um, there's room for growth. There's room to deepen. And there's room with a capacity to give life to something being rooted. So we as a congregation have lived with big feet. Some of us actually have big feet, <laughs> some don't, but it's really not about our feet. So as we, as I say, we began as homemakers and then we responded to a need and we began nursing and, and expanded that into other areas of healthcare in many capacities. We also moved into teaching particularly in places where um, there were few opportunities for education. And then into the evolving field of social work and many, many, many other embraces and responses to the cry for gospel hospitality. At the time, rooted in our identity at Martha's, all, everywhere we went, it still are. It's our identity that, that gives us the root. So our big feet are planted. And it's the identity that's in relationship with God. Our belief in the transformative mission of Jesus and our growing understanding of the non-denominational aspect of truth and peace. And the gift of collaboration that was with us in the beginning and with one another in the larger community. So to not be entrenched in one way of being in the world, uh, that there was room to grow, to move, to deepen, and to be vulnerable enough in our confidence of who we were. So we took a lot of risks. 
Do we always get it right? No, we didn't. But the key was we have to learn. And those are all key aspects of peace building. So the next one, having a thick neck, which really means using your voice, having your voice, the courage to give voice in challenge. So with her big feet firmly planted, Martha with, of Bethany, as stories and scripture tell us, was able to challenge. Um, if it was, it, she had the courage to give voice to her concerns that her sister Mary was slacking. She was a slacker. She wasn't doing what she, she wasn't pulling her weight. She had no problem telling Jesus, tell her to do something. She had the courage to, to, to see something that for her wasn't just. And then she also had the um, courage when her brother Lazarus was dead. Um, she had the courage to um, challenge Jesus and say, if you hadn't have been late, he wouldn't have been dead. I mean, the, the courage to do that. She also had the courage to proclaim who he was. Meaning that she never really lost sight of who she was. So there's that vulnerable confidence again in who she was. So she's often depicted with this thick neck. And, and, and it's her strong voice and her willingness to advocate for what she saw was wrong. And I think that that's something that we've taken on as well, is this ability to uh, give voice when we see something isn't, isn't going. And Darlene will unpack a bit more about the hows that that happens today, the how of that happens. But all of this is still kind of attached to St. Vincent de Paul's <laughs> saying about to see the dignity of persons and the unity of essence. Always seeing that, even in challenging even if we don't like what we see, we don't like the person saying it, we still see their dignity. And I think that's really key. And we're seeing that in the world today. Mm. We don't see the humanity in each other. We always have to see the humanity in each other. So we have to stick our thick necks out and claim, proclaim our humanity for one another. So we learn from Martha then to challenge where we see injustice and to do the necessary work and then to invite others to the table and accept them whenever they arrive and wherever they choose to sit. Even if it's at the foot of someone we don't want them to sit at, we have to be ready to accept that. So much like the Anaganish movement in people schools, the lives, the lived experience of people need to be voiced, welcomed, and heard. So it is that it is that gathering together and being together. And whoever needs to be there will be there. And the ones that are there, why? Asking the question, why? Why aren't they there? So it is a courage to challenge. And that flows from our ability to hear, embrace, and respond to the cry for gospel hospitality. So my favorite part of peace building as Martha is the dragon. <laughs> so the next one. Next. There you go. So there's this medieval legend. I love it. Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and some other people were set adrift in a rudderless, sailless boat and with the idea that they would perish. And so off they go, and they land in what is now the Provence region of France in a town called Tarascon. And this, this village is being tormented by a dragon, being terrorized by a dragon. There's killing, there's disappearance, there's all these things that are happening, terrible things. They couldn't do anything. Yeah. They, couldn't, they tried to kill this dragon. They couldn't get to this dragon. Everybody tried to remove this dragon. So this is where Martha, as the peacemaker for me, comes in. So she arrives on the scene off their rudderless, sailless boat, and she goes out to meet the dragon. She doesn't wait for the dragon to come to her. She goes out to the dragon. So she, she's confronting this dragon. She goes into the dark cave where the dragon is. <clears throat> and in this vulnerable situation, again, it's this vulnerability, she somehow finds a way to use the oil in her jar to anoint, to 
to, to put it on this dragon, to tame this dragon. And she ties her sash around it and she leads the dragon out of the dark into the light. So she tames this dragon. She doesn't slay it. She doesn't kill it. I've seen stories of people talking about, you know, Martha is the female George, the dragon slayer. She is not. She did not slay this dragon. She befriended this dragon. She accepted it for what it was and for who it was. So as a model of peace building, we learn from her hospitality to this dragon that when we can befriend our fears, whether that's of, of the other, of a situation, um, of our perceived enemies, those that we see as other, we can welcome the dragon in our lives and offer space. That's that homemaker again, offering a space for life to unfold. And as a congregation, our rootedness and our values and using our individual and collective voices to challenge and invite, we embrace collaboration still and are blessed to have people like Darlene and others, many, many, many others to help us continue to be about building peace. So this Martha Dragon story for me, it's just a wonderful way to illustrate the being confident in who you are enough to step aside of the fear and seeing the dignity. She saw the dignity. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously putting this on the story, but for me, seeing the dignity in that dragon, even that it had, a, it had, it had an opportunity. It, it should have been ha given an opportunity. Why was it terrorizing? Like the, but why in conflict? Why are these things happening? How do we analyze that and go back into the root cause of things? So her solution was to befriend this dragon. So that's where we are today. And I think there's a slide there. They're old pictures. There's a new, another picture of a dragon somewhere that we'll show at some point. But that for me, I just wanted to get that like as a basis of the the what gives us the the animation behind what we do, the inspiration and the why we're peace builders. Okay. And now we have coffee. Thank you. So Jigaf is handing coffee up. <laughs> I'm just going to transition into doing my bit. Okay, honey? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't say that. <laughs> but I do say, I love that there's a coffee thing happening at the same time about this is a hospitality. This mm -hmm. is wonderful. Yes, and it's full circle for me too, because I also met Tagafi at St. Paul University, but <laughs> our story went in a different path. Um, but it's very nice to all be together here and have this opportunity to share with, mm -hmm. with you all. And apologies, I, I, I'll look in that direction sometime, but I'll try to project mm -hmm. my voice. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, everything that I'm going to say builds on what Joanne has said, you know, and a lot of, of a lot of those pieces are around what grounds the work that we do. Um, so I am the coordinator of Martha Justice Ministry with the Sisters of St. Martha. And what that means is I uh, oversee the work that we do, which is usually education and advocacy on a range of social and ecological justice and reconciliation related issues. And I do that in uh, collaboration with a whole bunch of people. So I'm going to just uh, go to the first slide, the next slide, to show you just a little bit about what grounds us in our work. And you'll really see in this statement of purpose for Martha Justice Ministry, a lot of the language that Sister Joanne has shared already. Um, so, you know, language like pursuing justice, striving, we strive to work in solidarity with others for immediate and systemic change. 
to foster and contribute to spaces for dialogue, contemplation, and collective action. Emboldened in our belief in the inherent dignity and interconnectedness of all creation, we strive on the path of right relationship to contribute to the thriving of peaceful and resilient communities locally and globally. And you can you can unpack every single word there because it all everyone is significant. And even the process of putting that statement together was something very deliberate and and thoughtful and uh, as as everything that the Marthas do, <laughs> deliberate and thoughtful. And really it it and there's a picture there of the core group. So this is the committee that oversees the work of Martha Justice Ministry, which is made up of some sisters of St. Martha and some folks who are lay people, not sisters, including myself. And really what, what it shows you is this grounding in, first of all, the, a sense of the fact that we're inter interconnected, that all creation is interconnected. And really as that is a starting point. You have to, it compels you to be in the world in a certain way. Um, and to work for justice and, and to hope that we are reflecting that interconnectedness in how we are in the world. And that includes dignity, recognizing mm -hmm. dignity. And it includes working for peace. And so these things are, are all parts of that same foundation. Thank you, honey. <laughs> uh, next slide. So we wanted to talk about peace as a way of life. And, you know, really it, it is reflected in our work in direct and indirect ways. So sometimes we are directly working on peace related things, and sometimes we are indirectly working, but we are always grounded in that sense of interconnectedness of all creation and of inherent dignity. And there are a couple of frameworks that, that kind of, um, fit into, we fit into these frameworks in the work that we do. One is integral ecology, which is something that the language comes really most recently from um, Pope Francis encyclical Laudato Si, which was focused on care of creation and really a, a plea for a response to the climate crisis and a sense of urgency around that. But this idea of integral ecology would really, <laughs> really strongly voice the fact that you cannot separate social and ecological mm -hmm. justice. They're interconnected, they, they can't be separate. And similarly, social and ecological justice and peace can be separated. So knowing that all of these things are intimately tied together and that as well as that part of Catholic social teaching, which is a long tradition in the Catholic church, you might not know about because it isn't always lived very um, you know publicly um, but it is a tradition that centers the work of justice and human dignity and peace mm -hmm. and all of the things that that we're talking about and so when that's your foundation you know the work for justice and peace flows out of that and so we see this work as part of an interlinked process or a path or a way of being, as Joanne shared with the sisters. But it requires practice. It requires the development of tools. And it requires different approaches because people are at different places, you know, and understanding. So that practice has to be internal for how we are with ourselves and with each other. And then it has to be in our communities more broadly. So part of what we do with Peace as a Way of Life is build relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's relationships mm -hmm. with each other in, in our work together. And, you know, at bigger scale globally. And really reflect solidarity and dialogue. And voice, as Joanne was talking about, the thick neck, <laughs> a prophetic voice, a voice that is willing to speak out um, when, you know, we really see that 
the you know our society our communities are not reflecting this interconnectedness and this inherent dignity we need to speak out next slide please so just concretely um some of the ways that we do that in our work is we work on a, a range of kind of priority issue areas and we work in a whole bunch of different networks um so the you know i i look at this and i think my goodness <laughs> it's it's a lot for the small group that we are yeah and uh, and it's quite wonderful to be able to do work in areas like poverty eradication food security um affordable housing climate and ecological justice reconciliation and right relations peace justice for migrant workers refugee rights mining justice we do work in all of those areas and we work kind of, you know, in expanding circles where it, some of it's very local, some of it's regional, national, and in, even international. And there's some of the, the networks that we're part of or that we have, you know, kind of ongoing relationships with are, are there as well. So locally, the Anaganish uh, Coalition to End Poverty. We've got regionally the Basic Income Now Atlanta Canada Network. Maritimes Guatemala Breaking the Silence Network are, are good, you know, partners that we try to support. We've got development and peace locally and nationally and internationally that we are we are supportive of. And then kind of more Catholic oriented um, national coalitions and, and circles that we're part of, like the Office for, of Religious uh, Congregations for Integral Ecology, which is a lobbying office. Uh, on climate and reconciliation related issues and then joint ecological min ministries. So these are all networks and coalitions that we're part of that allow us to to do the work that you know builds out of that that grounding um, on these issues of of importance and and it amplifies it too to be we are able to share with all of these networks the work that that is important to us. And we share that shared work with the sisters and with the local community. So it's this back and forth relationship. Next. So, you know, concretely, um, you know, really, really on the ground, <laughs> we do uh, have a program that's been running for 10 years. And this, this program, the New Growers Program, has been teaching young people um, to be uh, have mentoring to be market gardeners or farmers. And this is part of the long legacy of the Marthas as farmers. Um, the Marthas fed generations of people on their land um, and did so with a very intentional, you know, desire to care for the earth and care for those in need. And this is a continuation of that. Um, and it's been running for 10 years with many of the folks who've gone through the program are now farming. You know, they're, they're still really, really living that, what, what they learned. And it's, it's just a gift. Mm -hmm. um, next, these are just a couple of examples of things that we, we do. So we're, we're always doing uh, work around climate action and creation care in different ways. Some of that involves being part of public events like rallies that are taking place. Uh, here locally, I was able to participate in uh, in COP26 as a delegate, a virtual delegate. Uh, this was the climate uh, UN climate conference. I was also able to go to the UN biodiversity conference uh, COP15 in Montreal, and that, to me, being able to have those experiences is I bring the voice of Martha Justice Ministry to this global conversation. And I bring the global conversation back here to the work that we're doing. And that's because this is something that the Marthas value, you know, and allow, allow this, this work to be done. And we also um, care for creation through prayer. So every month of September, uh, we're part of something called the season of creation, which is um, a global ecumenical um, month dedicated to prayer for creation care. And we participate in that. Next. 
Um, and of course, we, um, you know, the Marthas through Martha Justice Ministry and many other ways show their strong commitment to um, supporting Indigenous rights and reconciliation. And many of you, I, I mean, I don't need to explain who Sister Dorothy Moore is. I don't think <laughs> she's a remarkable sister of St. Martha. And luckily last year, um, she published a book of her, of her many talks, um, which I think is probably here in the library. If not, it probably we can get it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to use this book as part of a, a book study um, that that we had in last March. Um, and at the end of the book study, uh, Sister Dorothy joined us for for one of the sessions. Um, and I, I mean, I just can't tell you how moving it mm -hmm. it was to have her with us um, as a as a Martha, um, as a, an Indigenous elder, as a residential school survivor to to share herself with us. It was it was so powerful. And we we also did a blanket exercise with the group. Um, and so there are a range of ways in which we we use education and advocacy to support reconciliation. And so I, I was talking about frameworks and also about you know kind of that global reach and then bringing the local and global together. So Another framework that, that we kind of uh, work under and connect with is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, which are 17 goals that um, most countries in the world have uh, signed on to that are, you know, they've committed to reaching by 2030. 2030 is not very long from now, <laughs> and we are not on track to meet these goals, but uh, Needless to say, Canada has signed on as well, and we take that very seriously. So the fact that Canada signed on to end poverty by 2030, Canada signed on for no hunger by 2030, that's globally and domestically. Um, so we always try to put that in front of, of us in our work mm -hmm. and anytime we're talking to members of the government to say, you know, don't forget we signed on to this and we're expecting you to follow through. And so we have participated in um, an, a, a number of different processes around the, the SDGs, including Canada's last report on, um, on how it's doing with implementation. And we were in our Martha Justice Ministry and the Sisters of St. Martha were included in the final report for Canada on, on uh, its progress, which was kind of cool. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> okay, next. Um, so, as was mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things I also work on is uh, representing the Marthas uh, with the Sisters of Charity Federation, which is an international federation that the Marthas are part of, who have a United Nations uh, NGO, non-governmental organization at the UN. So that means that we do participate again on that global scale as uh, voices um, for, um, as global citizens and civil society to say, again, this is what we expect you to do, to, to hold governments accountable for the things that they've committed to. And that civil society voice makes a difference. Um, you know, and, and it's something that I, the Marthas have committed to as, as important in how we share that voice. And of course, peace is, is one of the ways that we do that. And so more directly, you know, around peace advocacy, some of the things that we've done in the last couple of years include the list here. Um, and I was just looking up today, actually, today is the third anniversary of the, um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons coming into force. Um, so this is a UN treaty that Canada has not signed, and we have asked Canada <laughs> to sign. <laughs> So one of the things that we've done in our advocacy is call on Canada to sign and ratify the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Uh, we've called on the federal government to support a ceasefire in Gaza and efforts for a sustained peace, and we've met directly with our MP about this. We've called for an end to violence against Mi'kmaq fishers and a resolution of the conflict regarding Mi'kmaq fishery in, in Nova Scotia. 
We've called for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and Peoples, and the 94 Calls to Action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we, we support all sorts of campaigns through our networks, including Development and Peace, um, Breaking the Silence, Kairos, and others. Um, so just in terms of kind of concrete, focused, specific advocacy on peace. Those are some of the things that we've done. And uh, the sisters have on their property a peace pole. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the history of the peace pole very well, Joanne. Um, the peace pole came, Jovita, you may even know when it came. It was probably around the 100th anniversary, mm -hmm. around then, 2000. I can't remember if it was here when I came or if we came at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely no coincidence if that's the case. <laughs> probably why. Yes, could yeah. be. They needed it. <laughs> they saw me coming. I but, think that's exactly. And and I think what it is is every language that's been spoken by a member yeah. of the congregation um, is on that poll, yeah. and it, and it does say let peace prevail on earth, and it's part of a network globally of of peace polls. Our dream. And it's come to reality a couple of times, and hopefully it'll come to reality again, is that it, we could have, um, we used to gather every Wednesday at 1250 and say a prayer for peace. And um, there's something about going up that hill past the hospital. It's hard to get people <laughs> to come. So maybe if there's a peace poll there, we could do something. But that's that's something that if we had a, a place that we were gathering intentionally for a few minutes to meditate, pray, send energy for peace. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of it. Mm -hmm. It's moved around the property a lot. Mm -hmm. It's in its permanent place now mm -hmm. in the Bethany Centennial Gardens. And so, yeah, so this, you know, kind of one of the last slides here around peace is prayerful practice. I think again, brings us back to that grounding, um, you know, connecting what we do with our spiritual foundation um, and prayer being part of, of, of the practice of peace mm -hmm. um, and the importance of connecting with the sacred, um, the importance of being open to dialogue. And I... <laughs> Something I, I participated in a webinar last week, and um, something really stood out, out for me around this. And this was uh, about the synod for synodality. And I'm not going to get into all this, the Catholic <laughs> stuff that uh, is around that. But it was a a big gathering of um, some representatives in the, in the Catholic Church. And one of the participants was a sister from Newfoundland, Sister Elizabeth Davis. And she was she was there in attendance at the Vatican, um, in convers in hard conversations with folks that didn't all agree, um, and so she said she was talking to the Canadian Cardinal uh, Cardinal Cherney, and he said something to the effect of, uh, "We don't always agree, but we always agree to di dialogue." And I just thought, what a what a, an important peace statement mm -hmm. because. Peace is hard work mm -hmm. and it is constant. Um, and what it takes is your willingness to continue in dialogue. You have to be willing to say, I'm not necessarily going to agree with you, but I agree that we need to, we need to be in dialogue on this. It's to have that table where yeah. anybody can, you're invited, everybody's invited to the table and you come whenever you can. Mm -hmm and sit wherever you need to. Yeah. 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 yeah it's creating space. Yeah. It's, and that's, you know, it's a practice. It's going to be internal work. It's going to be work with each other. Um, and I think that's, that's what we try to do mm -hmm. in our work. Um, and this final slide, I don't know. <laughs> Mar Joanne was going to walk into the room here with a dragon costume. <laughs> Let's figure it out. <laughs> That's Joanne. And there is nothing funnier than seeing Joanne walking around with the costume. <laughs> like it's huge. Like the tail will hurt you if you if she turns around fast enough. Um, but yes, it is uh it's quite a, a, a statement. <laughs> well, the thing is, peace is a serious thing. 
It's a, the work of be, building peace is a serious thing, but that doesn't mean you can't laugh. This breaks the ice, a dragon coming in. It made its debut with a bouquet of flowers, throwing flowers to people. <laughs> but it is a way to say this, a friend, this table, it's a hard table, but I see who you are and I see your dignity and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Much. I, uh, I, as I said earlier, I uh, I began teaching grassroots peace building online this January, and today I had a class with students from Mozambique, Nigeria, Ethiopia, wow. Canada, mm -hmm. and one of the question was, um, how can we have a dialogue when polarization is so entrenched that people don't want to see eye to eye mm -hmm. and you are telling us about dialogue mm -hmm. it is a profound question and i have encountered it in many ways so how do we come to what i call the unlocking of the heart that you cannot have a dialogue with locked hearts mm -hmm. so you have to unlock it and what is the process of unlocking that heart and willing to sit down in the same room. Dialogue is not about winning. Mm -hmm. In dialogue, there's no winner and losers. It's about thinking together. And it's about winning together. But to get to that point is the challenge they're talking about. And at the same time, how do you manage to have fun talking about this dark issue of conflict resolution, reconciliation, and peace? So, um, I tried to answer the question in a way I can, but each community, each society, each structure has to find its own way to facilitate a dialogue, to listen to each other, not agree with each other, but to listen to each other. So we have a lot of work to do in that regard, and, and most of you are already doing it, and particularly these two have been doing it for quite some time. Um, so now we, I think, Brian, we have questions started coming a couple of weeks ago online. People are asking questions and Brian have a few questions. Before we get into the questions online, is there any reflection, any insight, any question from here? And uh, we will address the issue. Um, Peter, yes, please. I, uh, I saw a video that took place in a situation where there hasn't been too many symbols of hope, and that was the Gaza. And it was a group of teens who were doing what's called parkour. I don't know how many people understand what that is. It's like a, an urban cross country. You don't run the streets. You climb fences. You go over buildings. You go through them. You go through subways, and this group of teens, um, it was such a change from watching people pull their dead children out of the rubble. And what they were doing is they were doing part four. They were doing the flips and the running and the climbing through the rubble and the devastated buildings. And the sense of joy that they had doing that I'm sure is not what the Israeli Defense Force wanted to communicate. Mm -hmm. And what they went completely, such a, a peaceful protest in the midst of all that. It was really moving to see that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things for me about peace building is that um, like I said, it's a serious thing and it's counterintuitive of us sometimes to see people having joy in a refugee camp, experiencing joy, expressing laughter in a refugee camp. But for me, that's just that symbol, that sign that life, life wants to live. And it's to, it's to find ways that people can live that. That, that they can let that life that's in them that wants to live to live in in, in whatever way that needs to happen. It's it, it's a tough one. Um, mm, I, I think 
one of the things in class we talked about is imagination and creativity. Mm -hmm. How do we imagine a better way of conveying and communicating a message than the conventional way? Yeah. And poetry, literature, drama, theater, and even what you just mentioned. So we have to really push our imagination and come with new way of conveying a message, profoundly powerful message. What you just shared is profoundly powerful. But when we are cornered into hopelessness, yeah. when we are pushed against the wall, sometimes our imagination kicks in. And that imagination is the best way we can come up with. There may not be an immediate result, but there is an immediate communication. And that is the most important thing that out of refugee camps, out of prison cells, out of different tragic situations, that powerful communication emerges. It's bringing the dragon out of the dark into the light. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Robin Newstater, and I used to work at CODI with the um, Peace and Conflict programs through the Women's International Institute for National Leadership, and now I'm with the Department of Adult Education. I just want to thank you so much. I just get really nerdy and excited about <laughs> heartfelt conversations about peace, and um, I want to add to this conversation or this topic, and that um, maybe in regards to um, thinking outside of the box when it comes to how we think about what life should be like for people in Gaza, refugee camps, prison, or um, single mothers in public housing, uh, people living in poverty in Nova Scotia. And we have through the narratives that we hear all the time through media created these images in our head of what life is like for people in these situations. And when I think of um, that socialization, I think that maybe it's not learning to do that. Maybe it's going back to the child in us. Because when I think of children, because what I hear you talking about is this element and of play. Right, and I think children, so often I worked for 20 years with children, young children before they went to school. They don't see all of that. They haven't learned and you know been so influenced by these hegemonic narratives of what people in poverty look like, what life is like in war zones mm -hmm. or post-conflict zones. They embrace it all and they see that complexities and they don't see the color they don't see these things that adults that we've taken in and started to believe and so I think maybe it's about going back to that you know unlearning and going back to what we need more it's that entrenchment right like we get stuck in a one way of seeing things right and to recognize yeah. that there's the powers that be out there that want us to yeah. think that way mm -hmm. And so by thinking outside of the box, there's somebody's agenda is out there when we think about poverty, is there mm -hmm. somebody living in poverty a certain way? And we don't see the assets and the brilliance that they have and the yeah. ingenuity, mm -hmm. right? When we think of them as the single mom in public housing on welfare, mm -hmm. and we don't see her creativity, her ingenuity, her entrepreneurship and doing these amazing yeah. budgets um, and the way she raises her kids. Right, and so that serves a purpose for somebody, and we need to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And by challenging that, we're creating that resistance. Mm -hmm. So, and then getting to what you were talking about earlier about seeing the whole beautiful person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I should have invited Robin to my class this morning. It's precisely what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What we. You're all, I'm, I'm always. Well, I'm all well class. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we discussed was. In peace building, particularly north versus south, global mm -hmm. south and global north, 
the starting point for some NGOs, for some government initiatives is these people have nothing, exactly. so we can go help them. If our starting point is they have nothing, mm -hmm. then we have already created a gem. Mm -hmm. yeah. totally. We have already created a structure which is based on domination. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying they have nothing, if our starting point is what do they have? Cultural assets, mm -hmm. rituals, practices, culture, social, all those things are there. But always, I mean, when you, I, I don't watch CNN, but in the back in the day, when I used to watch CNN, the, the journalist will stand in the middle of Africa or Asia and say, I'm in the middle of this dusty town. They have nothing here. Come on. People live there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, stigma, branding communities, mm -hmm. yeah. calling them the way you want to call them. Mm -hmm. So in peace building, we have really, really to challenge that. Yeah. And our starting point is, respect and dignity mm -hmm. for all, mm -hmm. not just for certain group of people. Yes, please. Um, respect and dignity for all. Um, yes. I, my name is Jennifer. So I'm just here as me. Um, but uh, Eileen at the very beginning kind of commented on the idea that if I had 50 markets, I would change the world. And we joke about like, <laughs> well, actually, you could support the work that would be happening for those 50 women of one to um, And I think that we haven't talked a lot here or yet or anywhere about how we're taking care of the caretakers. So there's a lot of effort to put towards um, individuals as Robin was talking to all of the people that, that need the support that folks like Martha, the markets have always been um, behind the scenes making sure that those people are okay. But I, I'm sitting here wondering about who's making sure that they're okay. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work in the nonprofit sector, a lot of work in the charitable sector. They're dropping like flies. Mm -hmm. um, folks who are moving into private sector work or the volunteer base, the attrition of the volunteer base is just astronomical. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the peace builders are traditionally women mm -hmm. yeah. or those who lead with feminine energy who can't sustain mm -hmm especially if they're also taking care of children and they're also engaged in elder care and they're volunteering in their communities and they're burning out. So I wonder about um, if, there's, if there hasn't yet or ever been built into these movements, care for those caretakers, mm -hmm. what we can learn about what we haven't been doing so that we can start to do it differently and address the burnout in the sector mm -hmm. before it becomes something where there aren't enough hands to live. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a sister in the United States. She's now the president of the LCWR, and she she came to one of our chapters and talked to us. But she said this in articles that if you if you talk about eventually, you've reached if you've reached the point of eventuality. If you even say the word eventually, eventually, who will run? We're already there. We are already there. We're already dealing with. It. We see it everywhere. We just see it everywhere. And for me, it's like, and I couldn't agree more. How do we look after each other? And and who's going to do it for us? And and it goes back to, um, you know, the 200-year history of apostolic religious as it's lived today is that it meeting need, right? There were no hospitals. There were no schools. There were no aid social agencies. Those needs were being met. We're at a time now where... We need the same kind of entrepreneurial spirit. I couldn't agree more. I think when we talk about vocations, we're talking about an entrepreneurial spirit. There's something about that. There's a creativity in that. So how do we refocus? How do we look at it through that lens of um, helping one another? And that's that gift of collaboration together. But for me, it's also the big feet, the being rooted and recognizing when I need room to grow, when I need room to go deeper. And, and then if we're connected enough with one another, we can see someone's need to go deeper. Or somebody can't go any more deep than they already are. They've, they've reached that, yeah, they've hit the water. You know, they're a pine tree in a swamp. Um, and it's gonna, it's just gonna, it's gonna suck the life out of them. So I think you're right. I think it's, it's about, um, having the time to be together and creating spaces. But you know, one of my pet peeves is my mom has Alzheimer's, she lives in long-term care. 
I hear this thing about home care, you know, aging in place, we're going to bring home care. And my sister had to have every second, and this isn't an exaggeration, every second of her day planned. Because mm -hmm. if one person was late by five minutes, her day was shot. If something got canceled, she couldn't hold down a full-time job. She could only work part-time. And even then with a boss that was flexible enough to say, okay, you can't come today, you're gonna come tomorrow. That's not sustainable for anybody. That's part of that myth, right? Mm -hmm. That we look after each other. So you're right. There's a lot of work that we need to do. Um, yeah. Can I <clears throat> I just want to make a couple of points that were probably piggyback what was said earlier. We often say we got to think outside the box. There is no box. Mm -hmm. And if we grasp onto that, there it really is no box. We created them and we get ourselves back in it, but there is none. And the other thing that I found really important is to ask, what are we for? rather than what are we against? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because to be against anything has no weight, has no power, but to be for something is really, and the other one I just wanted to piggyback from your, your sharing is uh, there is no such thing as the poor, mm -hmm. the rich, the homeless. There are people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And until we see that, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the person, like Netanyahu is a person, he hurts in some ways, and I'm a person, and I want this. How do we look at our humanity? Mm -hmm. But no, thank you. I just wanted to throw that into that mesh. Yes. I'm going to bleed from where a lot of you beautiful women have spoken, and you too, I'm happy. Um, <laughs> but, but there is quite a large female voice in the room. Um, thank you very much. And I've, I've never thought of, I work in healthcare. Um, my work in public health is, is largely with people that people don't really want to hear about, think about, or love, or care about. And, and so when I think about what we would call harm reduction in my work, and I really think of it as loving people however they are, because I, I really do believe the only reason we exist is to love each other. And when you bring the word peace into what I do, I've never thought of, of my work in public health as being a peace builder, but it is. It's been seeing someone who is underhoused, who's a survival sex worker, who's maybe living with addiction, trauma, all the things that takes away people's dignity and humanity. I see them as that human and I just want to love them. And the first thing I say is not, hey, I'm calling because you have hep C. It's, hey, I'm calling, and I hope we can do something today to make your day better. Yeah. And the harm reduction strategies are peaceful. They're peaceful, and they're loving, and they're kind. And I've never thought of it that way. So thank you. It's really brought a different awareness yeah. into the lens that I'll look through my work. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate all of you, Rob and Jennifer. So many of you have spoken today. Um, thank you. It's been wonderful. Ryan, can we go to online questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was three or four questions online. You guys touched upon some of the answers, but the one that I wanted to concentrate mm -hmm. now is from Hamidat. Um, and he was talking from a Muslim perspective um, with his family that is uh, a Christian Muslim. Um, and he and another person were asking about the context of, uh, another person was working in Cameroon, in the context of how do you work for peace in areas that you know prayer might not be a factor, and I think Degas could talk about the you know, different context and how you approach that stuff. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, for me, I guess one of the things in a in a in a non denominational, in a non even a non religious way, because a lot of the world doesn't identify for very good reasons with uh, organized religion. I think for me that I've held on to from my early time in, with Thomas, Dr. Peace, understanding where we're coming from. Like, so we finding, talking about starting points, we all have a starting point. We all have our own starting point. And so understanding where each other's starting point is, um, really understanding that and what, and what underpins what animates their spirit? Everybody has a spirit. 
Um, and what under underpins that and what gives animation to that and like, um, and then negotiating from there, a common starting point to move forward together. What are the things that are gonna, um, and it, that again, is that that confidence piece. And, and I, Ivone Jabara, she's a Brazilian eco-feminist theologian. And I love her. And she has talked about I, that you, who will give us our confidence back in ourselves? And this is for me where the rootedness of Martha is. If everything is a threat to me, if I'm afraid of everything, then there's something about me that's not confident. So who's going to give us back our confidence in ourselves? So it's it's about helping each other find that source, that's that strength that keeps me rooted enough that I'm going to continue to grow and deepen. And so I think it's that not being afraid of, of everything and, and you be who you are fully and it doesn't it changes me in all the good ways it doesn't it doesn't scare me I'm not afraid of it and vice versa and we negotiate going forward in it with a new starting point does that mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. I don't have anything <laughs> yeah it, it, this is this is important um number of uh, I mean St. Paul University when I was doing my master's one of the professors brought two guests. So it was a night class. And one of the guests was Rwandan genocide survivor. And the other guest was a Holocaust survivor. And she's a psychiatrist. And they both talking about the power of narratives. Mm -hmm. How narratives are constructed deliberately to dehumanize and to degrade and to label that group of people. And the Rwandan genocide survivor said, the story was like this, he said. Yeah. The other side framed us as cockroaches. The reason for that is one, if you are a cockroach, you don't deserve to live. The second and fundamental part of that narrative is to dehumanize, to degrade you. And he said he has a big gush, machete gush on the back of his head yeah. that he survived. And he said, I was hiding under the grass for two weeks. And I can see people looking for me as if I was a cockroach, opening it sort of looking through the grass. The narrative got deep inside. That constructed narrative. They believe that actually those people are cockroaches. They can hide in a small space of grass. So when we talk about having different ideas, how do we see each other as humans, as interbeing, connected. That African philosophy, it says Ubuntu, a person is a person through another person. <laughs> Individual existence is contradictory in terms. We don't exist as individuals. It's not possible. So the question raises that, that looking each other as humans, as equals, as those who deserve to live, to grow. So uh, it, 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 one thing really over the number of years last probably uh, after the end of Second World War and even today is what is really becoming a very frightening trend is how narratives are constructed. Mm -hmm. The savages, the animals, you know, the, the, the insect, whatever, whatever name. So when we hear those languages, we have to stand up straight and say no. It, it, it doesn't matter who is included in that narrative. Mm -hmm. So th th those are probably the ways we can actually look at uh, interbeing and connectedness and in, in, in understanding each other. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Yeah, there's a question here. Um from Joe Gunn, uh, it's for Joanne and Darlene. Reflect on the specific super contributions of women to peace building and how we can all build that out. We know Joe, so we're not sure if we should take him seriously on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Whatever you want. You go. 
What's the well, specific super contributions of women to an super end contribution? Like, you have great, maybe, maybe the question should be, or and I don't want to assume anything, Joe, but you know, can you give us some examples of great peace building women and some of the things that they did? And how would you use them as examples? Or, um, well, I don't think that I would label them as great super women. I think ordinary, everyday women, like Robin pointed out who find a creative way to make craft dinner nutritious uh, with a coupon is a, is a peace builder of superhuman capacity. Um, there's a lot of ordinary women, but there are, you know, bigger figures um, for sure. But I mean, it could, it, it seems like there, if you think any, any justice area that you can think of, basically there's going to be, a woman <laughs> working for justice and you know, like what comes comes to mind very quickly is Helen Frejean mm -hmm. in the U.S. who is a, a nun who worked to end the death penalty mm -hmm. I mean she's still working on it but it's that kind of witness you know that kind of uh, persistent witness to human dignity if you can fight for the dignity of someone who is on death row maybe for reasons of you know, very serious violence, and still say that person doesn't deserve to die. I, uh, you know, it's it's a hard thing to sustain that level of commitment in the face of what I think many people who would disagree. Yeah. You know, and it's that kind of of you know, I, like there's so many Dorothy Day. There, there's yeah. you know, people like. Uh, any of the sisters that I, was that I know. Say, I mean, we we have an allergy to patting ourselves on the back, <laughs> but I just want to say, in my role in leadership these last ten years, I've I've been um, involved in writing obituaries and mm -hmm. and receiving condolence messages when a sister dies, and I got to tell you, there are some sisters who you would never have known their names because they were homemakers in a convent or an institution somewhere. They're not the, they're not the Irene Doyles, the Marie Michaels, the Dorothy Moores. They're not that. They're the they're the women that when everybody was out on their external ministry, were reaching out to the people in the communities in which they lived, making a huge difference, making the life of a woman stuck at home with twelve kids easier. There are many who have touched the lives of many. We only hear. I mean, we. I'm going to speak for me. Because I don't, I haven't been around as long, so I don't necessarily know these histories. But when I hear that, I think this is where peace building is at. It's those are big feet. Mm -hmm. They're big feet and they're thick necks. You know, these are women that gave voice to a lot of small things um, in their way. So yeah, Joe, they're they're not um, necessarily the ones that are going to get. Not to take away from any any of the ones that I mean, for me, Dorothy Moore and Veronica Matthews, oh. um, for me, are just a, a source of great grace for us as a congregation um, in many ways, uh, and there are lots of other sisters like that as well. I mean, I I, I spent a fair share of my life in in conflict areas, and what I witnessed is that while the gunfire is going over there and men are fighting. Women are here baking bread mm -hmm. for the children. Mm -hmm. While the, the shells are landing on their homes, they are thinking about what's going to be supper for my children. Those who carry on their backs the wounded, the hungry, the thirsty, those are women. If we have to really authentically understand peace building in active conflict areas, before conflict, during conflict, and after conflict, we have to name the women. They are at the center of it. They are at the center of sustaining life. There's nothing more than sustaining life as a peace building. And they work day in, day out. And at times, they don't feed themselves, they feed their children. Yeah. Can, can so, I say something about peace, like what you're saying? that I had an experience in the classroom once when we were trying to, I mean, peace means something different to everybody. I mean, there are as many definitions of peace as there are of, you know, brands of coffee. 
So we were trying to get what is an indicator of peace. So bringing it down to the to your home when you, in your home, what's an indicator of peace? And we and we purposely uh, home make like the the traditional gendered roles. And it was so interesting. What was an indicator of peace for the men in the room? were indicators of peacelessness for the women, mm -hmm. almost point for point, almost. It was a powerful moment in that classroom. I'll never forget it. It was a, this dawning realization of the pressure put on to make sure that the kids were fed, their homework was done and everything was ready for the man to come home in a very traditional way for for them to realize how peaceless that made the women in their home. Mm. And if you want to know the everyday peace indicators, go to Robin. She had a very comprehensive theoretical framework about what is everyday peace indicator. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, any other question, mm -hmm. final question there? I think we touched upon different pieces of, and whatever love about how you bring hope in a conflict area mm -hmm. uh, or you know hope for the peacemakers themselves as well as hope for others mm -hmm. um so we touched upon that a little bit but any questions from Pierre? well i think you know i'd like to i'd like to encourage this can, this there's one that oh okay mm -hmm. um, um, so my name is Beth Keller. Thank you very much for this conversation. And what I'm thinking about as I'm listening to the different um, voices is um, a lot of the, the intentional learning I've done around restorative practices and um, how I, when I've been working on my elevator pitch over the last 10, 15 years about restorative practices, um, people have often asked me what it is in my line of work. Um, I think it's just about humanity, and um, I've often described it as putting, it's not a thing, it's not a checklist, it's, you know, when I first got my glasses, uh, they're a very low prescription, and when I put them on for the first time, I lost the TV, I thought, oh, <laughs> I didn't know things weren't first, now I know, and so when I think about restorative practices and, and the concept of what we're speaking about today and listening to each other about today is that Restorative practices is about doing things um, not to and for people, but with them. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm thinking about that um, in context specifically around what we we're saying around, oh, you know, they, they don't have anything down there, so let's go fix that. And, and what we're really missing in that conversation. And I think that framing lends itself in our day to day interactions with our colleagues and our families, with our relationships, as well as in this bigger, broader context of work. And so, um, yeah, just thank you for the conversation today. Thank you. Yeah, and I was just going to say um, thank you all for being here. And it, it kind of makes me feel like we need to do this more often. Yeah, <laughs> we do. You know, because we, we, we incorporate this in the work that we do, but I think very intentionally having conversations about these issues and peace in particular is really essential right now. Um, it's essential for everyone in different ways. And so uh, this, the interest in the conversation we've had today really um, mm -hmm. makes me feel like we should build on it yeah. a bit more. And if anyone wants to keep the conversation going, we can, we can see how, how we might do that. Pauline, did you want to say something? You got your bike muted. Just thinking about uh, when we talk about humanity and we talk about creating narratives, we talk about making assumptions, and we talk about what basis, what what where our practices are based. And I'm just thinking about the language we use and how language can be such a tool for peace building or it can really close the space mm -hmm. for peace building. And for me, it's something that I try to be mindful of, and it's something that I need to continue to, to learn and shed in many cases. But when I think about the housing crisis in Canada today, for example, we constantly hear in the news and read in the papers and hear people referred to as low-income people or low-income communities, or the homeless, mm -hmm. the precariously housed. And with the best of intentions, 
we are not acting peacefully toward people by using that language. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I think it's just something we can all work on, something we can all do a little bit better while we're trying to open spaces for peace. Because when we use language like that, we're starting the narrative off. Mm -hmm. And we're identifying people by their, their circumstance in life rather than by their humanity, mm -hmm. rather than by who they are as a person, mm -hmm. who they have the potential to be, what their hopes and dreams are, mm -hmm. and, and all of these things that make up our humanity, not by how they treat others. And I think it's been really helpful in the last couple of months having active volunteers in the housing encampments in HRM, for example, mm -hmm. because the media seemed to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate in that some of those volunteers do see people's humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about people who live in those encampments, they talk about that being their home mm -hmm. and what that space means to them. They don't talk about low-income people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's been really helpful and really encouraging uh, to have folks in those situations who are shedding light on humanity mm -hmm. as well as the contextual situation that is brought them there. Mm -hmm. But for, I just wanted to mention it because for me, it's the starting point to the narratives that we create. Mm -hmm. so thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for you and for you for coming in and sharing your expertise, knowledge, thoughts, insights. Um, and I think what we have discerned today is this has to continue in the coming months and years uh, it, because it's very important for us to engage in this kind of platforms and in this kind of frameworks.